Hello, hello guys. Day six already. We are coming to the end of the week already. I can't believe it. But first, how much did you enjoy Alex's interview yesterday? I love I love speaking to Alex. Always if yeah, it's so fascinating, all the stuff he can share with us. And every time I speak to him, I learn something new. Yeah. What do you think, Claire? How do you find yesterday with Alex's interview? He's got such a way with words, hasn't he? And I love how he really puts the animal and puts the dog at the forefront of of the whole process you know and I think that's very um it's very professionals isn't it a very professionals viewpoint like the dog is is the center of our world and how he was explaining things for people to get using their hands that they don't necessarily need much in the way of equipment uh, with those massage techniques phenomenal phenomenal if anybody's not done that come on come on <laughs> Give it a go, guys. Give it a go. Well, today, so I'm personally excited to share with this with you. So today we have Angela White. Um, I'm not going to say how long she's been in this dog training industry, but it's been a long time. Um, I learned absolutely masses from her. Um, she was the first person I went to when I started my dog training journey all those years ago. So let's just delve in. Let's have fun and listen to Angela's knowledge that she's gained over the years. Let's get going. I'm super excited about this interview. We have Angela White with us, who I did loads of my training off when I started started my dog training journey. So first of all, I would yeah like you to, if you can introduce yourself, Angela, and tell us a little bit about yourself and definitely tell us a bit about your dogs as well. Hi, well, yeah, I'm Angela White. I've, I've um, been involved in dogs and dog training pretty much all my working life, going back to the mid 70s when I first started with dog training I got myself a little crossbreed mongrel from the RSPCA um, and didn't really know that much about dogs but I'd never been allowed one as a child and um, so as soon as I was independent I, that was one of the first things on my list um, and she taught me a lot I was really lucky in that I went to um, pull dog training club and for the for Considering it was the 70s, they were really quite forward thinking and they used a lot of play and, and enjoying your dogs um, compared to some that were more sort of still using check chains and, and yanking dogs around. They didn't seem to do that, um, not so as I noticed anyway, but I was very naive um, and my dog was a delight. So there was never any real need in my eyes to tell her off anyway. She was she was a mongrel, but she had sheltie like tendencies and she was more the size of a small border collie um, <laughs> and cut like a sheltie. And, but they called her a cross German shepherd border collie. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so that was my, yeah, that was my first dog. And she was called Gucci, um, which I picked up from a Barbara Woodhouse book. Um, I can't remember what it meant now. Something to do with in Indians and cowboys and things like that. <laughs> oh, like, wow. Um, and, and then she got called Gucci in the end, and which uh, one of my clients many years later said that was an amazing name to have for a dog because uh, it was like a Gucci handbag. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so she, she was my first love um, in dogs. And then I went on to get involved in competitive obedience. And the dog club, again, led me into that. I had no transport, so they took me to places. I then went to another club and they had a, a club bus and we all used to get on together um, and go to, to dog shows and I started taking part in obedience and really enjoyed it. It was the love of my life. Um, then got another dog, German Shepherd Border Collie, which to me was must be the best thing since sliced bread. But I actually wanted a Border Collie and I always wanted a Border Collie since I saw them. Um, I saw one in a, in a field being played with by somebody just enjoying their dog and I thought that is absolutely what I want one day yeah. and I did get <laughs> one one day <laughs> uh, gosh how much do you want to know this <laughs> could go on for hours oh um, easily yeah especially when we start talking about dogs well, what dogs have you got now currently um currently well my latest dog is a Liam Berger and she was born in January um and she is an absolute delight she Obviously, it was during COVID lockdown, so we were not allowed to go and look at litters and things. And we just made a family decision that we would have at least one last Leon Burger because I'm getting older now and they are a lot of dog. 
I was uh, thinking you said this seven years ago. <laughs> I think I actually did say this more than seven years ago as well, yeah. Um, no Molly and Burgers, they're too big. <laughs> yeah, I just, well, we got the support of the family. Everybody does a little bit with her as well. Um, and I said to the breeder who I knew, I just went on the internet to look to see what was around and I spotted a breeder who I, I'd had a rescue dog from before. I'd, I'd, res I'd rehomed one of her. Liam Burgers that had gone back to her for some reason. So I knew her and I just contacted her and said, hi, I see you've got a litter. Um, I'm looking for a dog with no issues. <laughs> I want the perfect temperament. I'm not worried about whether it's at show quality, but I want the perfect temperament. I want confidence, um, but I don't want a stroppy dog. I just want something nice and confident and, and interesting yeah um, one of the reasons for that is my grandson who is now eight um is not fond of dogs which is amazing to be mm. to believe but he's got some issues with with dogs um but not our doing but we wanted a dog to be able to help him to be more confident and so on so um the hope is that he will be that the dog will be to some extent, an emotional support for him. Oh, fair. Um, and also, I just wanted a dog to do what I wanted to do at whatever time. I wanted the sort of dog that I could take anywhere, do anything, um, and that sort of dog that I can travel with and so on. Oh, um, crap, yeah, definitely. So, yeah, and she she ticks all the boxes. I'm so pleased that you know the breeder really did listen to what I wanted, and she ticks every box. She's fabulous. But oh. she's a teenager at the minute so that's a bit more difficult but uh, you know she she is lovely um I have two older Leon Burgers as well they're now seven going on eight so they're coming towards the um latter part of their lives but they're still very fit and active and um she's just started to be allowed to be with them for half a day <laughs> <laughs> well I remember, I, remember, I remember those two ain't I because I knew them as yes. puppies yes you would know them as puppies yeah I think yeah. they were teenagers as well then at the time when I was doing all my training. I remember yeah. them. Yeah, so that's Dougie and Dixie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, their mum sadly passed away um, just before we got the new puppy. Um, but she she had a good long life. Um, I've also got two Border Collies. Um, Jez, who you would have known then. Yes, he's I remember Jez. Yeah. Um, so he's 14 now and he, he's still switched on he still wants to do things but his body won't let him <laughs> so, yeah. but he's doing pretty well for an old man um and the other one the other collie is a, a, a rescue somebody i think i was about home number four or five um and i was persuaded <laughs> in a training session somebody was messaging saying i know you'll be looking for a dog to take over from jez at some point and um and I wasn't planning it right then, but yeah, she, she again ticked the boxes. I said, well, it would have to be a female. It would have to, I don't want a heavy coat because I don't like grooming. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> Leon <that> <laughs> uh, I, I, I prefer a tricolor and I want it to be registered. And, and there we go, and tick, 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 tick. So yeah, so I went, oh, go on then. <laughs> <laughs> and she's lovely. She's a real work dog. She, she just yeah. loves working. Um, she doesn't like sitting still for very long. Um, she's a proper working border college. She's ISDS registered. Um, for people that don't know, what's I ISDS? ISDS is International Sheepdog Society. Um, and the people who breed border collies for sheepdog trials um, use that system, the, the international system. Um, whereas for us competing in obedience or anything like that, we use the kennel club. Um, but you can dual register. So if it is ISDS, you can then apply to the kennel club to register um, a border collie on their register as well. So, and I've got one Pyrenean sheepdog left as well. Um, oh, that's Tyke, who you would it definitely Tyke? know. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tyke is 10 now. Oh, wow. um so but he's still a spring chicken in his head 
Um, it's just, I would say it's marginally slowed down, but I don't think anybody else has noticed. <laughs> I'm just thinking of him walking into your building, actually. He was always so busy. Yeah, very, very busy little dog. Um, and nothing's changed, really. He, doesn't, he only sleeps if, he, if you close the cage door, <laughs> basically. Otherwise, he'll be up and doing and saying, can we? Can we do this or can we do that? So, <laughs> but it's, yeah. <laughs> I think that's it. I've still, I've still got my clicker cat, believe it or not. She's 19 now. Oh, um, we'll have to talk about your clicker cat shortly, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I just lost my clicky pig. Yeah. <laughs> we had Felicity, who you'd give you a high five, and her little trotter's only about this big. And I, <laughs> I, one of my students taught her to do it, and I went, I don't doubt your ability to teach the dog. The, the pig rather, but I think that the uh, the trotters are rather small. She might not get them up, but she did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. Yeah, we'll definitely have to talk about the, click, the clicker animals that you have. Yeah, yeah. You've trained yeah. as well very shortly. Um, so that's all your dogs. So what do you do with your dogs? Uh, if you tell people a bit about, because I know all about your centre that you own, because I also did my training yeah. there, but you have a full centre that you have people, pet dog owners, but also dog trainers come to, don't you? Yeah, so we teach all levels really from behavior problems um puppy classes kennel club good citizen all levels and we have our own program our master dog trainer program where you people like you can come along and train your own dogs and it's open to enthusiast level dog trainers i would say and we get lots of instructors and behaviorists who just want somewhere else to train their dog because when you're a teacher you, you end up teaching all the time and not and if you're not careful you forget about your own dog and your own time um and we run um, an eight unit course that is for aimed at people who want to be in the industry of dog training instructing um, and behaviorism and it goes the eight if you do all eight then you have the knowledge and skills um to become a, a behavioral trainer if you do one to four, then you've got all the things you need for an instructor level. Um, but a lot of people also do it just for interest for their own dog. So some people come and do it because they want to, which is lovely. We've got a chappy on it at the minute that's doing it because he's got kennels. Yeah. And he just oh, wants wow. to know more and he wants to help people that come to his kennels. Um, so oh, we get all sorts of different people on it. And obviously you had me on it many years ago. We did, <laughs> yes. And what a pleasure that was. The very start of my training journey. Yeah, yeah it was great. And I, I always recommend people to come up to you. I say it's such a great venue. And just learnt, learnt so much. Learned absolutely so much with you that comes up now all the time. I'm like, oh, I learned that years ago. <laughs> yeah, you, it's amazing how much there is to learn, isn't it? Oh, God, goodness, yes, yes. And there's always, always new stuff and always stuff to learn. Yeah. Like, you, like you went back about there, you talked about you have a course for dog trainers to do, keeping up to date on our knowledge and going, go, us getting to go be trained. Yeah. Yeah, it can easily get missed. Um, I've, I've got a current puppy as well at the moment, and I, I'm the same. She's a gun dog. Yeah. And so I'm going to good dog classes with her That's again. Super learning more more new things all the time all the time yeah well we have all of those different types of classes running now as well so we have someone I, i'm not a gun dog specialist but i have someone that comes to teach that is and he's also done all the units as well um and then we have karen holmes obviously i'm a clicker fan i have been right from the beginning but karen holmes who was one of my instructors that came through the the eight units then went on to do the Karen Pryor Association clicker training as well. So she's a, a KPA. Um, and so she now runs the clicker stuff with me. And if we get a lot of people, I go and help her. Um, but oh. she's, she's perfectly capable on her own. <laughs> so click training. Let's yeah. talk a little bit about Look click it. training. I know you've written a book on click training. I have. And I think you, you were one of the first people to start using it in the UK, if I've got my information right, if I can remember. I've got your information right. In fact, as I believe it, we were the first people to demonstrate clicker training at Crooks and the first people to sell clickers. And we, it was done on our trade stand at Crooks many years ago. I can't remember the date, but it is in that little book. <laughs> is in that little book. Is it? Well, for the people yeah. that don't know, um, what, what is a clicker? Because I think clickers quite often get um, 
used in the wrong way, let's say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember someone telling me once, yeah, I click my click and my dog runs inside. And I was like, oh, that's not how you're supposed to use it. So for people that don't know, can you explain to them what a clicker is and why we like to use them? Yeah, um, the clicker, we, we teach the dog that when it hears the sound of the click, and that really could be any sharp noise that's acceptable to the dog, but the clicker gives us a, a, you know, a nice little instrument to use. So the click will mean to the dog that a reward is coming. And we usually use food to start with, but the reward can actually be anything that the dog wants. So in the past, I've even used touch work with a dog that just wanted to be stroked all the time. Um, so you first of all start with click, making the clicker go and putting food in the dog's mouth. And it doesn't matter where the dog's looking, it can be looking completely in the wrong direction. And I just go click and stuff the food in. And the dog <laughs> starts to go, oh, when I hear that, that happens. When I hear that, that happens. And over a little bit of time, once it gets into the idea, it then starts to think, how do I get her to do that click thing? What shall I, do? you know, and the dog starts trying to work out what will make me click. Um, and so now I've got a dog that's saying, teach me, instead of the dog going, I don't know what you're on about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's a lot faster because the dog is keen to learn and it's the click sound hits the brain really quickly much faster than any verbal cue could so you could say well I could just say good or I could use a click word instead which is you know everyone does that as well um, but the beauty of the clicker is that sound hits the brain really fast and where it hits the brain is right next to where the reward system is as well in the brain. So we now know through work that Greg Burns did that actually what we believed is actually true. Um, so we've now got scientific evidence, which is amazing. Which, yeah, it's absolutely brilliant, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you also talked about, we're talking about clickers, um, you also talked about your clicker cap, which I know about. You mentioned your pig. Um, I also know you have trained a fish clicker training as well. Oh, yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about, yeah, get to tell us a little bit about those three. And we talk a lot about engagement and connection with our animals. Yeah. Do you think by using the clicker, it can help and boost this? Definitely. Um, I will talk about those animals in a, in a moment, but just to give an example of how that works, you know, when I get the dogs engaged, I've only got to say, where's that clicky thing? <laughs> which is my get ready we're going to do some work I said where's that clicky thing and the dogs are like yeah what we're going to do they get so excited and I'm so engaged and really listening not being silly but really concentrating on on what we're doing um so I, you know when it first came over a chap called Bob brought a load over I knew him from obedience for many years and he'd been working with Karen Pryor and uh, he brought all these clickers over and it was a lot of jargon to start with um and I, I found the jargon hard and I was, um, I was a lecturer in animal behaviour, so I did understand it, but I still used, found it hard to use it. And, um, but so we simplified it a bit and, you know, got people started. Um, and, you know, the idea is you can teach any animal um, to do anything that it's physically and mentally capable of. So you've got to think about the restrictions of the individual animal. Um, but you can easily get a fish to go through a hoop. Um, if it's not a sort of fish that will break the surface normally, then you're not going to achieve that or it's highly unlikely. But you certainly can get them to go from left to right on cue and then you can drop a hoop in and they end up going through the hoop. Um, and that's what I did with fish. It's a, you know, <laughs> my nice novel name. His name was <laughs> Fish. <laughs> and I used them um, to get the, the sound or the, the signal to the animal has to be thought about as well because you, you know a clicker's not going to work for a, a goldfish in a tank um so i had um a, a doorbell that was now mounted on a piece of um wood so it was like a freestanding doorbell and it was a big old-fashioned one so it made a lot of noise and it vibrated <laughs> and the fish somehow was was acknowledging that so we used the the push the bell drop the food in, push the bell, drop the food in. So just condition it in exactly the same way. When he hears or feels the sound of the bell, then the food's coming. Um, and then, so once he got that, we just waited for him to go left to right and then push the bell. 
food and then it very quickly it was going around and positioning itself to go to be able to go from left to right so you could see when I arrived the fish is going right where do I need to be oh I'm <laughs> out there around there over there click feed <laughs> um and then gradually then I put a, a large-ish um hoop in that it didn't even notice and then we made the hoop smaller and smaller so it was eventually oh, wow. going through a hoop um and we put a cue on it so it on that little starter bit where he was going, oh, I need, I know where I need to be. Then we put, a, I just put a, I think I used a spoon to just tap the water. And that, that was the signal to go, basically. Yeah. Oh, wow. So I love yeah. we've actually got this story recorded. I once told some people this, they didn't believe me. They're like, you cannot train a, fr a fish. And I was like, you're blooming yeah. fan. I've been told. Um, yeah. People have done it even better than me since then. You know, you know I've seen, you can look them up on, um, on the internet and um, there's all sorts of things that people can achieve with a, with quite a lot of patience I have to say yes. it was not a quick fix um, <laughs> it was I almost went oh I can't be bothered with this um, but I did persevere and we got there um, the cat was a lot easier um, with a cat you're looking at an animal, animal again with a small appetite and so what we did there was sort of think carefully about what food we were going to use and I put her on a, a meat and poultry diet only and used fish for training. So when she got fish, which she really liked, it was always novel and new and she's not just had a fish dinner, um, which helps with the motivation. Um, and particularly used tuna, which was her favorite. Occasionally cream cheese as well, you know, <laughs> like Primula out of the tube. Yeah. Um, and she, I started with her when I worked at Bishop Burton College and we was I was um I wrote the degree on her animal behavior and training and part of the students um work was to train a different animal to a dog didn't matter really what it was and but I didn't have anything at that time that I could demonstrate with so but we had a colony of cats a closed colony so I chose one of the cats from the closed colony and went in and quite a few times about 28 cats in there <laughs> and I kept going in and training her and in the end all the other cats are trying to get in on it yeah <laughs> so in the end I said I need to take this cat home and work on her separately so that I've not got all this other cats just getting in the way really um so I took her home and trained her so she can do um high five she's not so good at high five now because she's getting old <laughs> Yeah. Um, but she can come up and high five. And do you remember the Bacardi cat that used to come up on its hind legs and dance? Yes. She can do Bacardi cat, and that was the cue. Bacardi cat, and she come up. Oh, uh, brilliant! She can run to a target. Um, so a target mat on the floor, and she'll go straight to it. She recalls on a tap tap. She recalls back, um, and she could do twist and spin and retrieve as well. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah she I did quite a lot of work with her over the years and just kept improving it she never did get to go back to college <laughs> stayed with me <laughs> um, you couldn't really put her back into a closed colony no you've just said that over the years so I just want to pick up on that about because I think people especially with dog training they go oh I want to teach everything now but you've said over the years that I trained yeah, you yeah. so yeah. Yeah. How off? How long do you spend like doing dog training or your cat training or your fish training? <laughs> how long, say, would you spend training each day? Because I think, um, especially dog owners, they tend to go, "Oh, I need to spend like an hour or two hours training every day," um, mm -hmm. and they think if they do that, it'll, it'll all be done. All be done in a year. So, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that their concentration span is is not long enough. You can teach any animal for a longish period of time if you have lots of breaks in it so when I'm teaching in a class for example we'll do an exercise and maybe do two or three repetitions and I'll stop and say 60 second brain break sit everybody sit down give yourself a break give your dog a break it's only 60 seconds it's not coffee time <laughs> and then in 60 seconds I'll get them up and do some more um, so you can you know we do keep people going with their dogs all day um, but it's lots of 60 second breaks in between um, giving time for the information to sink in, for the brain to um, utilise it, for want of a better word. Um, and the cat, for example, 
I used to, I got into a routine with her and I used to train her just after nine every day in the morning, about 20 past nine by the time I got round to it. Oh, and when just, 20 past nine was. I think they froze for a second, I think we're back though. Hey, yeah. we're back, it's all right. Yeah. So I used to, she, she learned that 20 past nine was the time for training and she started all like, meow, meow, meow. <laughs> yeah. So I, I allowed that to happen to, to keep her motivated, but she would train at other times as well, but 20 past nine was training time. <laughs> um, but again, small amount of time because, and also a small amount of food. So you've got to monitor if you're using food for training, how much food you're giving and you're not you know, going to upset the dog's diet or the animal's diet um, and you're not going to um, overfeed and end up with a, an animal that's overweight. Yeah, because that's something people often worry about, isn't it? Um, we're doing all this training, once we get this engagement and we'll get to our connection from our dogs, but they're worried about, have I got to feed this dog all of these treats? I'm going to end up with a fat dog. Yeah. And what I tend to do is, is have a portion of, of food that I'm going to use for this training session. And I'm fairly strict with that. So um, it depends on the animal, of course, but I'll say, you know, this little bag of food is for this puppy's training session and it's also its lunch. So, um, so you make sure if you're working with a very small animal that the food that you're using is nutritious and can form part of its, its main diet. With a very large animal like a Leonberger, for example, it's not quite so crucial. But you can soon, you know, make them have an upset tummy if you give them too much of the wrong thing. And um, so you have to play around with that a little bit. Um, and they need a lot when they're learning, but they need less as, as they get the idea. So, yeah. but the, the secret is you must keep rewarding because it's a bit like us if, if, you know, if you're training to do a job and I give you a thousand pounds a day and when you can do the job, I stop paying you you're not going to do the job, are you? Not for very long anyway, so, and the dog's the same. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, great. I remember bringing my, he would have been nine years old when I brought him up to you, my nine-year-old dog, um, and he, yeah, he was still getting paid. He would get paid for a good recall. Yeah, um, I, I always love to speak about him as well, because everyone said, well, you can't, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I said, well, I did a nine-year-old. I took him dog training. I was learned to be a dog trainer. I didn't have any other dogs at that time. Yeah, yeah. no, they can, they can learn you know all the time they, they you know unless they've got some deficiency mentally they, they'll carry on learning for until their last days definitely definitely um i want to pick up as well you said about with your cat when you're doing the click train with a cat um your cat would only have fish for training and then would have like poultry and stuff for main meals is that just to make sure they knew when it was training time no it was more to to be motivational um, so if, if you if you give most dogs kibble for all their meals and then you keep giving kibble for training as well, they, there isn't any any difference in what they're being rewarded with compared to their main meals. So I sort of applied that concept with the cat. So how do I make the cat's rewards different to the main meals so that she's got a, an interest perked up straight away? <laughs> and so that's why we went with the, the um, tuna, which was easy to access as well, I suppose. Yeah. You do, yeah. They do put their claws onto your fingers to get it sometimes, though, so it can be a little bit painful. But <laughs> if, if you get into the habit of, of um, putting it onto a teaspoon or something, then you get away with that one. Definitely, definitely. Um, what else are I going to pick on what you said? Oh, you talked about patience. I think patience is a big thing in dog training. I don't think people are very patient. I, I know personally, I'm not a very patient person. I know I'm having to always like slow myself down quite a bit. Yeah. And um, how you do? You, how important do you think patience is when you're doing training? I think it's as important as understanding what you're trying to do. Because <laughs> um, I think those two things are, are often the problem. And un, if a person doesn't understand exactly what they're supposed to do to achieve the goal then they're going to lose their patience fairly quickly because they're not seeing success I I personally nowadays don't teach my dogs for very long at all and not even that often but I get it right but that's just experience 
you know, if I'm not getting it right now, there's something wrong, isn't there? <laughs> Having been seventy-seven, um, but I, well, we'll still make mistakes, yeah. but I can recognise them. Um, yeah. So if you can get a really good understanding of what you're trying to achieve before you try to do it, then you'll not more than likely have the patience to follow it through because you can see the success coming. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. I think it's really important, yeah, to know where you're going with them before you even start trying doing it. Yeah, I think I learned that from doing competitive obedience because in the first, with the first dog, I never really understood anything beyond what I was doing at that time. And when I entered my first pre-beginner class, I just assumed everybody else was doing the same thing over the whole show. I got no concept of there being a, a test ABC championship or anything like that. I just, you know, I, I couldn't see beyond what I was doing at, at that stage, but I was very naive. Well, can um, you explain to everyone what competitive obedience is? Because some people won't know what that is. Yeah, it's, um, it's a bit like dressages to horses. Um, competitive obedience is it's very precise you've got to be very patient and you've got to be all I would say almost obsessive about technical detail to to get it right um, so it's a very precise very stylized form of obedience the heel work particularly is very stylized the dog's got to hold an exact position and it takes a long time to achieve that Obviously, again, the more experienced you get, the quicker you can do it. Um, but even people who've been at it a long time will find some dogs more difficult than others. Um, not every dog is suited to it. Mostly people use collies because do collies are obsessive. And so if you've got an obsessive sport and an obsessive dog and an obsessive person, it seems to come together. Um, if, if people are interested in doing obedience but don't want to go to that obsessive level, we now have rally obedience, which is a much looser sport and, and is, is more forgiving. It's still quite technical. There's still a, an awful lot to learn. Yeah. Um, and there's still all the technical exercises, but the, the need for precision is not as great. So it's a really good place to start. Sort of maybe if you've done um, good citizen gold, got to that stage, you easily start to do well at rally at the low level and then you can pick up from there. Yeah, I, I've done so, I, well, I do some rally until our unfortunate last yeah. year happened with uh, my, with Maisie, who you, who you probably would have met actually. I think yeah. I was just a puppy uh, yeah. I remember, yeah. 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 So yeah, yeah, with Maisie, we've been doing some rally, which she's been really enjoying. And yeah, you don't have to be, I'll admit, as precise <laughs> as competitive obedience. But it's, it's, rally it's not of <laughs> Sorry, I hold a rally record actually. Oh that, yeah, that nobody can ever beat. Because when rally first started, they used to um, put more than one show on, more than one. Um, I can't think what they called it. You were allowed to what work more than one, more than two classes. Now it's just two classes. But I had um, my border collie who had never competed before and my Pyrenean Sheepdog, who I'd done my first one with just to have a go at it. And we went to another show and I made my Border Collie up level one excellent um, in one day. And the other one got his excellent title as well. Oh, so wow. two dogs in one day from, and one of them from nothing. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, that's my claim to fame. <laughs> <laughs> that's wow. Nobody can beat it. <laughs> And so with getting two dogs to do that to get your your claim to fame what mm. sort of foundations would you start with with those dogs what would your be to get so we like i said we talk about an engagement and getting engagement from our dogs we talk about you need to get like the foundations right first yeah is there any like top games that you like playing with your dogs to get maybe you've got a young puppy at the moment what sort of yeah. things are you yeah. doing for engagement with your young liam Berger? <laughs> um it's more a case of trying to get her off me than getting her on to it at the minute. But yeah, I play tuggy games. Now I'm getting older with big dogs. It's I have to manage that because it can be quite painful. But I do play tuggy, but it's a controlled tuggy. Um, and and fetch, just going to pick something up. It doesn't matter where, what it is, when it is. I never tell them off for picking up things off the floor. So we were away at um, a show a few weeks ago and my Leonberger kept picking up bits of card and plastic 
that were behind our camper van. And each time she picked something up, I just, I, I took it from her because I didn't want her to chew it. But I just, good girl, thank you, well done. That's really good, have a treat. Because I, I always want them to be happy to pick things up that I ask them to pick up. So when they first start out, I never um, tell them off for picking anything up. If, if they know, I, I teach leave. That's the other thing I really do teach, leave straight away. Because if, I, if it's really something that they shouldn't pick up because it's going to be dangerous or something, then I'll just put my leave command in and move away from it. So that the dog, and so I think leave is one of the, the most important exercises you can teach. Leave and pay attention. Um, but yeah, lots of play, lots of play and fun. Lots of play. Yeah, yeah. Hiding things. I, I, I hide a treat under my leg and that sort of thing. Just, just getting the dog engaged. Um, my pup did her first... Um, scent detection lesson um, a couple of months ago now and that is another way of getting them to engage because they just love using their noses and she's got an amazing nose um, and just any game that involves scent they love as well so they're your top ones you're playing with your puppy at the moment yeah, get them to want to be with you want to get them to want in fact there's a chapter in my book happy dogs happy winners which is about competitive obedience and it's called the want because you want the dog to want to work or yeah. want to be with you, want to train with you, want to work with you. Um, and when you've got the want, then you've got a dog that's going to engage with you. And that will want, to, yeah. And then you can take it wherever you want, whether it's um, rally, exactly. yeah. obedience or yeah. wherever you want to go with them. Yeah. yeah. Or even if you just want a pet dog at home. <laughs> Exactly, because, you know, who wouldn't want to do a few tricks to impress the neighbours? <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. So you mentioned your books there. We haven't talked about your books. You've got, is it? I think I've got this right, nine books you've written now, isn't it? Yeah, only eight were, are available. <laughs> <laughs> so you're updating one of them, aren't you? Is it one of the first yeah. ones you did? I'm updating. The very first one that I did was an A to Z on dog training and behaviour. And the reason that I came up with the idea to do that was when I had my son, just 37 years ago now, um, I found a, a lovely book for bringing up children, which was an A to Z. And so if you had a baby who was crying, you could look under C for crying and understand what to do. And then in that chapter, it would um, direct you to different chapters within the book that might also help. Yeah. And I thought that's just got to be a great idea for a book. And I took the idea to... Um, a publishing company called TFH Publications, who are an American company. Uh, they loved the idea as well and, and gave me a commission to start writing. So there we go. <laughs> and they were the best company to, to be with. Um, they took me over to America when it was launched. Um, we did quite a few trade shows. Um, and it was just such a nice reception. We went and watched it coming off the production line and things like that. Oh, so wow. A lovely experience. Um, the best from a from a writer's point of view. I don't think it could have been better. Um, but yeah, I'm updating that now because that was a long, long time ago. Um, and so a lot of my ideas have developed. Some of them have changed completely. Um, and there's a lot that's not in it. Yeah. So the, the problem I'm finding is there's so many things that I want to put in it. It's going to be a very large book. <laughs> <laughs> um, it will only be available on the internet um, because it's going to be way too big to, <laughs> to publish. Um, I might chunk it down and publish parts of it. Um, yeah, it's going to be it's like mini books. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's going to be a big one, but it's an A to Z. So you know, if you've got a problem of your dog pulling, you just look under P for pulling. Yeah, I'll find the answers. So, you know, and you you'll find a whole array of answers and things that you need to be aware of and why the dog pulls and, and that sort of thing so it's not just well here's one technique and that's it there's, it's there's quite a lot involved um in each one and i envisage it being useful for dog training instructors as well um you know when you get someone who says yeah well i've tried that well hopefully in my book there'll be another method and you yeah. can have a quick look and an, an instructor will soon pick up the idea um, but equally, it could be read by people who are new to dog training. Oh, fab. That's, that's, that sounds really good. That Yeah, update it, because dog training changes, doesn't it? It does change. Exactly, yeah, yeah. 
yeah. science changes, um, everything. Yeah, well, there's, yeah, there's no clicker training in the first one because nobody knew about clicker training at that stage, you know. So. Oh, fab. I shall look forward to that coming out. So I've obviously got a few of your books already. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you mentioned about teaching dog trainers as well. So what sort of things would you teach dog trainers about engagement? Um, because like, like myself, when I first came to you, I was completely, absolutely new to it. I had my own dog. I've been to some, I've been to some like pet dog classes with him, but that was it, really. So we're talking engagement of the dog or engagement of the person you're teaching. It's, I think a bit of both. Yeah. Um, I think you've got to make the class interesting and real. Um, I don't like using the fun word because <laughs> If you, in, if you said, come to my class, it's fun, I'd go, well, actually, I want to be able to manage my dog better. <laughs> so I try to avoid using that. People laugh at me for doing that. Um, but it should be an enjoyable class that you can make sense out of. So we teach um, those basic skills and leave being an important one, um, but paying attention and so on and walking to heel on a loose lead. But then we put it into a scenario. So we'll say, right, we've got these skills. Let's say we were going to the shop and we're going into the pet shop and we're going to go and buy some food for the dog. So what do we need from our dog to be able to do that? Well, first of all, we need to get it in the car. So we better make sure we've got that bit right um, or on public transport. Um, and then we are going to go to the store and we don't want pulling in. So we need that loose lead walking and we are going to look at lots of nice smelly things so we don't want the dog stealing. Uh, I have to tell you a funny story about that in a minute. Uh, <laughs> with my own dog stealing in a <laughs> um, And then we need to be able to go to a counter and get served and give our money and our dog needs to stay under control. So we put all that into a, a reality situation, try and set it up. You know, I'll be there rattling my treats and getting people to learn how to manage their dog um, in those situations. And the same sort of scenarios like for we're going for a coffee in a cafe. Yeah. Um, we're going for a beer in a beer garden. That's what most people want from the dog. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it definitely is. It's something I have in my classes as well. Yeah. I tell people they've got um, field trips to do. I was like, this week you're off to the pub. And they're like, this is great. She tells us to go to the pub one week. Exactly. They love it, it's don't they? Cafe. We get them to take pictures of themselves in the pub, which is another skill in itself, doing a selfie with your dog. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so they've got proof. We won't, you know, you're not allowed to just say you've done it. We want the proof. Yeah. And that it's, actually creates a sort of a little bit of a, a nice social thing. We have Facebook pages for our members and they put me putting their pictures up. And if anybody doesn't put the picture up, they'll be pulling each other's legs saying, where's your picture? <laughs> so it can get a little bit competitive, but all, with, you know, nicely. Yeah. Oh, that's really nice. Yeah. Getting them all involved with each other. Go on then. You had a story about stealing. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> my Leonberger, first time out to the shops. Um, and we've got um, like a, a, an area, it's called Lakeside, and there's lots of outlet shops. It's only quite small. Husband was after a, an outdoor jacket. And so in, we went into one of the outdoor wear shops. I won't say which one. <laughs> and uh, But it allowed dogs. And they said, yes, dogs are allowed. We think it's important. You know, most people are out and about with their dogs. So we want dogs to come in. So I, I took her in. And um, I'm doing my training while he's choosing his jacket because she's a handful. You know, she's, I think, would be about six months at the time. Big Leonberger. And so I'm doing the training. And um, she was... Super, really good. Turned round to go out, he's done his purchase and I said, right, he's just going up to pay actually. I said, I'll see you outside. So I walks out and she just put her head down and um, when her head came back up again, it was it was complete with a fleece jacket that she'd stolen off the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to sort of say, good girl, well done, leave. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's the importance of the leave command. So she yeah. just gave me it straight away when I asked her for it and off we went. And so it was just funny. <laughs> it it's, been disastrous. <laughs> it's funny. It's important to get those foundations in right, isn't it? It's important to get all that stuff in right from the beginning. Um, I've lost my trailer thought then. 
you're getting the foundations right completely and also uh, this stuff happens to dog trainers as well guys not just <laughs> exactly yeah yeah, yeah. We're not and how many that. years of experience have you got Angela and it's yeah, something yeah. that's happened with you <laughs> I don't know how many it is since 1977 <laughs> you do the maths <laughs> more than 40 <laughs> so yeah yeah having yeah teenage dogs teenage dogs is a big thing isn't yeah. it the teenage yeah. dogs and i've got one at the moment i'm going to be honest she's not too bad at touch wood <laughs> definitely she's not too bad at the minute she's doing all right i keep yeah. waiting for it to hit more full in the head though yeah. at the moment for me now, this one's been a, a, a lively character since <laughs> the start but at the same time she takes the training on really well she's very bright she gets the idea really quickly um so while she might made, make the odd mistake or i i didn't uh, read the situation right um <laughs> she soon says you know she soon gives it up and, and so on she's never refused to give me anything so brilliant brilliant yeah it's so important to teach us stuff like dogs like giving giving stuff up but also that we don't always just take stuff away from them all the time it's you know picking stuff is, is a good thing to do God, we've got through yeah, quite a lot yeah. there. We've got through quite a lot today, haven't we? Um, I don't think I've got any more questions at the moment. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add, Angela? Anything about um, Have you got any top... There you go, I know. What about some top tips for people? Um, your top tips. We talked a little bit about... Um, so you should leave it and stuff, didn't you? So top tips for guest engagement. So I bet one of them is going to be play, isn't it? Play with Absolutely. dogs. Play, play with your dog. Um, scent work is is i mean it's become very very popular in recent mm. years but we've always it's always been part of our solutions to dog training problems um to to get out and about and do get your dog looking for things um because dogs just love it another top tip is to get out and get follow your dog to see what it's looking at and what it's sniffing at and sniff and look yourself and when you do that with your dog, it's an interesting experience because the dog's not used to that. So if you actually <laughs> go, what are you sniffing at? Well, is it nice? Oh, that's a nice smell. <laughs> Have a little conversation with them. You get quite an interesting response from your dog. And, and I would say with one of my dogs, that was a turning point in our relationship that I took an interest in what he was interested in instead of it always having to be the other way around. Oh, so tell us a little bit more about that. So you started, so it was literally just going on walks and sniffing what your dog was sniffing at. I mean, it was, it's a, a nice dog um, and I'd been training him for obedience, um, but I felt like I didn't have the relationship I would like, um, even though he was responsive and so on. There was uh, something niggling in my head, something not quite right. Um, and I think it's um, Temple Grandin, who is an autistic lady, um, wrote something about it in one of her books, you know, to to get down and, and search where your dog's searching and take an interest in your dog's life instead of being the taker, you know. So, and I was in a caravan, often I do these things in a caravan, I was in a caravan at a folk festival with my dog and I took him out, you know, sort of fairly early in the morning and I thought I'd been reading Temple's book and I thought I'm gonna have a go at that with this dog and um, so I found myself having a look through the, um, the sand dunes and, and so on where we were and having a good old sniff where he was sniffing. People look at you a bit strange um, but he suddenly turned around and looked at me as if to say ah you are interested in me it was, it was a strange, <laughs> strange thing to happen. And I took that idea over to a group of people in Germany and I was teaching over there. And the, the, the group were very literal. So I, I, I suggested that they, they go home and do it and, and also let's have a go now. And, and so they all went off around this field where I was teaching. And um, I think we've lost. Oh, lost. No. Sorry, right, by camera. So they all went off around. I think the cameras the just froze there. I was just re rebooting them. I'll see if hopefully that reboot them both. Okay. Sorry, carry on with your story. <laughs> oh, have I lost you, Angela? Yeah, I'll speak. No, I'm still here. Cool. Sorry, carry on with your story. The cameras had frozen, so I was just trying to get them rebooted. Yeah. There you go. We've got work working again. Okay, so I took the story over to Germany and where I was teaching obedience, um, competitive obedience there, and 
I said I suggested if they wanted to improve their relationships with their dogs that they should go searching and set them all off around the field. And they all came back with great big smiles on their faces and very wet knees because <laughs> they've been literally <laughs> crawling in the undergrowth with their dogs. But they, they were all amazed. <laughs> oh, so, yeah, brilliant. that's a good thing to do. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, that's, I think that's a really good thing to end on, actually. Um, they get getting, but also just getting down your dog's level. I don't think people do it enough. No. Oh, what you can do, actually, is come to my training centre and camp with your dog. Because we've, hey. we've got a campsite on, on site. So a lot of people like to just come and get away with their dog and spend some time. You know, if you can spend a few days or just a weekend with your dog um, and no other distractions, it's lovely and you do find that your your dog improves over a few days hey you've led me very very well into where can people find out more about you angela where can <laughs> find out more about your campsite and about your training center um from the website which is www.iabtc.co.uk um, we're also on facebook and it's the same facebook stroke iabtc um, the campsite is called Lupine Woods Campsite, and you can find that on Pitchup. Um, we're, and we're based at Haxie, which is in the North, North Lincolnshire. So we're on the border between North Link, South Yorkshire and Nottinghamshire, actually. So, um, and fairly easily ac accessible from about six miles from the M180. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. And it's that, like I can... Say so it's absolutely fab center. I absolutely love coming up to you. Really good up there. Um, so what well, says thank you so much for coming to talk to us today. Um hopefully I'll get to see you soon as well. Yeah, it's about time you came back. Yes, it <laughs> definitely is. Enjoy yourself with your dogs. Yes, come around to have some time off with my dogs for a change. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, thank you, thank you again for sharing with me with us today. And you've also going to be sharing. You've got an ebook. You're going to share with the, all of our watchers and listeners as well. So what we'll yeah. do is pop that in a link for everybody into the comments, so people can download that. And obviously, the other way you can find out about Andrew is through one of her many, many books. There are nine books, and keep an eye out for yeah. a new one as well that's coming out. So thanks a lot, then, Angela. I think we've yeah. frozen again right at the end. <laughs> yeah thanks for coming today. modern technology yeah modern technology i've got just got you back a little bit there. okay and thank you